So before I introduce May, since I know everybody is thinking, well, here's what I thought of what Bob just said, please turn to the person sitting next to you and share what of what Bob just said, Dr. Butler just said, did you find particularly important for you in your own thinking? Take a moment, please. You know, there's that joke of the um, guy's down on his hands and knees in the streets late at night. He seems to be looking for something. And somebody says to him, what are you doing there? He says, well, I'm looking for my keys. He said, uh, oh, really, where'd you lose them? He said, I lost them up that alley over there. Well, why are you looking here? He says, well, there's more light here. <laughs> so we all come into this morning, every one of us, with a, a notion as to what's the problem, what's the solution. And it may very well be that we're just looking at things the way we've always looked at them. So I'd like to leave open the idea that we might think of something differently as a result of our own thoughts or what we hear. I'm delighted to be uh, introducing May, fellow board member, remarkable woman, who has for more than three decades been a tireless advocate in the trenches for the needs of the elderly. She's the commissioner of the Westchester County uh, New York Department of Senior Programs and Services, where she's also served as head of the office in the department for 29 years. She's a founder of the Westchester Public-Private Partnership for Aging Services and co-founder of the New York Southern Area Aging, Aging Network, representing over 62% of New York's elderly for the purposes of addressing workforce development, joint training, and advocacy. She was a delegate in 1981, 1995, and 2005 White House Conferences on Aging. She also is a publisher of a newsletter that goes out to over 100 seniors every other month. Uh, a remarkable woman. Uh, Remarkable heart. I've had the pleasure of spending the last few days with May and her husband. If you join your uh, join me in welcoming May to the podium. Thank you, Pam. What are we afraid of? Are we afraid of the aging of the population? Can't we handle this? And what are we waiting on? We should collaborate. This is the greatest country in the world, and we certainly can find solutions to the aging of our population. So I think you're going to all agree with me that aging is not a tragedy. It is a triumph. We know that fear is usually the result of the unknown. We know that fear is sometimes associated with change. But we also know that if we don't face change, we can become extinct. One of my favorite books is Who Moved My Cheese? Have you read that book? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about who moved our cheese in this country in terms of preparing for an aging society. First of all, uh, they point out, the authors point out that each of us has our own idea of what cheese is, and we pursue it because we believe it makes us happy. If we get it, we often become attached to it, like our Social Security benefits, like Medicare, like affordable housing, like health care. And if we lose it, or if it's taken away, it becomes traumatic. We know that our homes and our communities, our relationships, our retirement incomes, the education of the children, the respect and of, of our dignity and our independence as we age are all very important. Let's look at some of the, some of the inspiring comments that comes from this book. Now just work with me. If you do not change, you become extinct. Now what's on the verge of becoming extinct if we don't change in this country? when it comes to dealing with our aging population. And what would we do if we weren't afraid to face these changes? This is my favorite. Smell the cheese often so you know when it's getting old. And I think these arguments about privatizing Social Security, that Social Security is going to run out, that we're not going to have enough resources in the richest country in the world to take care of our elderly and provide health care for all, I think that it is getting old. Movement in a new direction, thank you. Movement in a new direction helps you find new cheese. When you move beyond your own fear, you feel free. You feel empowered. I hope we're going to move beyond the fear of ensuring all of our citizens this week in national health care reform.
Now, we need to imagine that enjoying new cheese, even before we find it, will lead us to that new cheese. You know, this story is about um, a couple of little mouse, well, four uh, mice. Uh, two would go out and look for new solutions because the cheese had dried up in this maze. And the other two would be hesitant, would want to overanalyze it. I call that paralysis by analysis. And we see this happening in our country today on health care. Meanwhile, there are people who are going without their cheese. The quicker we let go of old cheese, the sooner we find new cheese. It may not be what we were used to, but why hold on to something that is causing anxiety and fear and just isn't working anymore? It is safer to search for new cheese in the maze than remain in a cheeseless situation. Now you can apply that to many situations here when it comes to dealing with the elderly population, such as catastrophic insurance, long-term care insurance. Old beliefs do not lead you to new cheese. Communicating, collaborating, and cooperating is the way we need to build new synergy and new energy and change those policies that will bring about positive change. And when you see that you can find and enjoy new cheese, you change the course. And finally, nothing small changes early. However, when you do have small changes, you can adapt to the bigger changes that are to come, such as national health reform. Now in our county, we know that our population is aging, and we know that the public sector and the public funds will not be able to provide all of the services that are being needed. So what we've done is we've created livable communities in partnership with AARP. In our livable communities program, we are creating informal services to supplement the shrinking public-private services. Citizens are engaged. They're providing volunteer assistance. We go back to the old village concept. You know, it takes a village. We go back to the old village concept where neighbors are helping neighbors. One minister called and said, I need transportation for someone to get to dialysis. I says, we'll try to arrange for that, sir. But how many empty cars do you have sitting on your parking lot on Sunday? Can you not organize a volunteer transportation program? The public sector will not be able to provide transportation for an aging population that needs to get to dialysis and get to other medical appointments. When Medicare Part D, uh, after its first year, I got a chance to walk around to some supermarkets and drugstores where they had pharmacies. Long lines were there. Seniors were in, in tears as they were being told, my plan, your plan no longer covers that medication. And one person said, well, how much will it cost? And the pharmacist says, it's going to cost you $500. That person says, I don't have that money. I used my last dollar to come here to get my medication. Now, my question was, how many neighbors went to that drugstore that week? Could they not arrange some type of errand service so that person would not have to spend their last dollar? In our village, which is our block, our neighborhood, a 52-year-old next-door neighbor was out shoveling snow, had asthma, and led to a heart attack, and he died. And his three teenage sons were in watching television. So what we did was we, 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 we developed a community asset. We chipped in our monies, and we bought a commercial snowblower. And it's housed in our garage, and we have a a checklist of things that needs to be done and who's responsible. And then we ask those young men to go out and clean off the snow for all the seniors on the block and then, of course, for those of us who contributed to the snowboard. That's a community asset. That's village thinking. That's neighbors helping neighbors. So I ask you, what are we waiting for? This country was built 
on people helping people. Um, when I first got formally into the field of gerontology and I started seeing terms like escort service, I says, well, look, that's just me walking grandma around the block to the corner. Now we got a formal name for it and we got funding sources for it. Well, you know what? There are just too many older people who need someone to escort them. So it's going to have to be neighbors. Neighbors helping neighbors. That's the village way. So I ask you, what are we waiting for? We don't have to be afraid. This is not going to be a tragedy unless we make it one. Thank you.